was born in the relative obscurity of comic books, thrilling and devoted following with fantastic adventures, heroic rescues, and daring escapes in the mythical metropolis of Gotham City. As a hero of Saturday afternoon movie matinees, he captured the imaginations of throngs of film fans who eagerly awaited each week's chapter of his movie serials. In the mid-1960s, a new generation of fans were treated to a highly stylized, colorful reworking of the dashing daredevil. And in 1989, more than 50 years after his debut, he has become a worldwide sensation and a multimedia star of one of the most phenomenally successful movies of all time. He is Batman. The comic book, a spin-off of the highly popular newspaper Sunday Funny Supplements. The illustrated magazines became an instant hit with young and old alike when Depression-era distribution began to rise in the early 1930s. An array of colorful characters involved in exciting romantic adventures helped ease the reader's problems during the most depressing Depression days. As the decade neared its end, one comic hero reigned supreme. The Man of Steel, Superman. This amazing stranger from the planet Krypton, the Man of Steel, Superman. Possessing remarkable physical strength, Superman fights a never-ending battle for truth and justice. Disguised as a mild-mannered newspaper reporter, Clark Kent. But the fight against evil was a huge undertaking public demand for newer crusaders of justice was constant. Bob Kane, a writer and illustrator for Detective Comics, was primed for the task. As the free world began to arm itself for a war which seemed inevitable, artist Kane envisioned a hero who would uplift the spirit of America. Kane analyzed the charismatic villain in the Mary Roberts Reinhardt novel, The Bat, who wore a mask over his face and took on a mysterious bat-like image to both intimidate his victims and foil positive identification for his crimes. The novel was filmed as a silent movie in the 1920s, and Kane took note of the visual flamboyance of the masked bat. It seemed perfectly suited for the action-packed pages of comic books. Altering the persona to that of a crime fighter and emphasizing the nocturnal nature of his namesake, Kane presented the Batman to the world in Detective Comics number 27. But unlike other superheroes of the era, Kane painted Bruce Wayne not as a born believer in the truth, justice, and American way, but rather as a crime fighter whose primary motivation is vengeance. As a child, Bruce Wayne watched as his parents were gunned down by a jewel thief. Years later, embarking on the crime fighting campaign of his own invention, but lacking the distinctive persona with which to accomplish it, Wayne saw a bat fly through the window of his den and his Batman counterpart was instantly formed. Kane created the name Bruce Wayne from a combination of two sources, Robert Bruce, a hero of the British Isles, and Mad Anthony Wayne, a dashing figure whose early exploration of the Indiana, Kentucky, and Illinois territories and countless confrontations with native Indian tribes made him a living legend of the colonial era. Batman was an instant hit with comic book fans, and his adventures, which featured Bruce Wayne's devoted butler Alfred and the eternally baffled city chief Commissioner Gordon, began appearing regularly as the United States went to war in the 1940s. Bruce Wayne's young ward, Dick Grayson, was also added to the comic book's cast of characters and, becoming Batman's sidekick Robin, altered the Cape Crusader's image, changing it to the dynamic duo. Grayson grew up in a family of circus performers. One night, as he looked on, his mother and father were killed in a fall from the big top, an accident that was later discovered to be murder. With Batman's help, the evil perpetrator was brought to justice, and Bruce Wayne, realizing that Grayson's tragedy mirrored his own, became guardian to the youthful orphan. Together, they conquered every evil imaginable and provided comic book adventures that galvanized America's youth during World War II's darkest days. 
But adults turned to the movie Serial, a staple of 1940s culture, which provided escapist entertainment in the form of cliffhanging 12 to 15 episode action films. Batman exploded on screen for the first time in 1943. Lewis Wilson was cast as Batman in the 15 chapter Serial, produced by Columbia Pictures and featuring the youthful Douglas Croft as Robin. Week after week, thrill-seeking audiences were treated to such chapters as Mark of the Zombies, The Living Corpse, Embers of Evil, Eight Steps Down, and The Doom of the Rising Sun. The plotline of the serial pitted Batman and Robin against an evil oriental mastermind, Dr. Daka, played by character actor J. Carol Nash. As anti-Japanese sentiment ran high during this wartime release, many racist and anti-oriental remarks were woven into the dialogue. By the time the 15 chapters of Batman had run its course, Batman had dealt with a variety of insidious super scientific devices, zombies, plane crashes, saboteurs, and even ravenous alligators. Most importantly, however, as the final footage unspooled in chapter 15, Batman and Robin had brought the evil Dr. Daka to justice and saved the free world from his plan of enslaving mankind. A full six years would pass before Batman and Robin would reappear on theater screens. The demand for heroic daring do, which fueled the serial's success during the war years, led to a second Batman serial, The New Adventures of Batman and Robin, in 1946. Robert Lowry starred as Batman, and John Duncan was Robin in the 15-chapter serial, which featured the first on-screen appearance of Vicki Vale as a snoopy reporter played by Jane Addams. The Vicki Vale character, legend has it, was inspired by Batman creator Bob Kane's chance meeting with an aspiring model named Norma Jean Baker, whom he met while on a visit to Hollywood. Years later, Miss Baker changed her name to Marilyn Monroe. And Commissioner Gordon also debuted in the serial. One time leading man turned character actor Lyle Talbot, best remembered as Joe Randolph from Ozzie and Harriet, did his turn. Summoning the masked crime fighters with a customized skylight, the Bat Signal, whenever Gotham City was in need of their services. It's interesting that the great Batman tradition, cultivated by the comic books for almost a decade, was again largely ignored when a villain called the Wizard was substituted for the more flamboyant and familiar Riddler, Joker, and Penguin. After World War II, Batman and his adventures were relegated to the domain of his birthright, the comic book while Batman's comic rival Superman enjoyed tremendous success on the infant medium of television. Faster than supersonic speed, bounding across the screen in an incredible battle for truth and justice, watch The Adventures of Superman. Despite Batman's exposure being limited only to comic books, fans remained fiercely devoted. When interest in the comic character built during the mid-60s, television producers took notice, and before long, Batman was transformed into a TV program which would become the entertainment sensation of the era, shattering the sensibilities of conventional television with its utterly unique storytelling technique. The groundbreaking style pushed the cliffhanging tradition of the movie serials over the edge of self-parody and painted it all in a crazy explosion of primary colors that went way beyond even the most hyperactive technicolor fantasy. Kids and adults alike were enthralled by the series. TV audiences just couldn't get their fill of Batman. You're one of those who just can't get enough of Batman. Help is here. Thank hey, Jefferson and 12. Hold tight. Bat turn. Too much of us, Batman. They have a right to expect it. But we're only human. There. Feel better? It's only temporary relief, we know. But the next episode is just a few bat hours away. Actor Adam West was cast as Batman and became an instant celebrity as a result. He'd appeared in a handful of movies such as Marriage of a Young Stockbroker and Soldier in the Rain. 
As one of the two male leads in Robinson Crusoe on Mars, the character he played in the film was killed off in the first quarter of the movie. West fared much better when he was cast in a major supporting role opposite the Three Stooges in The Outlaws is Coming. For the first time, the West's greatest outlaws in one great epic, The Outlaws is Coming. And the Stooges is ready. that was Annie Oakley, Buffalo, Indian, the U.S. Cavalry, and the world's biggest nuts at their wackiest in the wildest shootout ever to fracture the screen. West had appeared in a number of TV pilots which failed to become continuing series. And it was while working on one such doomed pilot in the fall of 1965 that he was spotted by Batman producer William Dozier and West suddenly found himself in cape and mask. 19-year-old Burt Ward became Robin, the boy wonder. Ward had been a champion ice skater at the age of two in his father's Rhapsody on Ice skating show. As a teen, he became a karate expert and a high school decathlon champion. Hoping for a bit part, Ward walked into Dozier's Batman audition in late 65, and while he had no previous professional acting experience, he emerged as both the definitive Robin and the world's newest teenage heartthrob. The Batman series was more than just an entertainment phenomenon. It was one of the most innovative programs in the history of television, presenting two primetime half-hour episodes per week, and linking them with a dramatic cliffhanger that borrowed directly from the motion picture serial tradition. Week after week, the Cape Crusader copes with the tricky traps of vicious villains. Will the time arrive when the Cape crime fighters come too close to the jaws of death? Holy metronome, what a fate! Punched in a player piano roll. Watch Batman in color. Week after week, new viewers tuned into the program and escalated the show's popularity. Even the traditionally purest comic book fans applauded the campy tone and lighthearted characterizations, which were far removed from the comic's darker tone. A large measure of the program's appeal was due to the inventive gadgetry employed in every episode. Ah! Oh, Waddle Canal, Batman! What now? What now? Why, everything's new as Batman and Robin battle flying with a battery of wonderful new bat innovations. The Batcopter, the Batboat, the Batcycle, and Flash, a late bulletin from the Cape. Three, two, one. The Bat Rocket blasting off. See the dynamic duo dangle from new heights of danger. Careful, Robin, it's quite a drop. See them batter their way through new bat ventures with old friends. Correction, Fiend. Holy dark canyon. I'm not just pussyfooting around this time, Batman. Meet their wild, weird new bat series, the archest criminals of all crime. Be with Batman and Robin weekly, in color, of course. While all of the crime-fighting devices used by Batman and Robin bore the personal stamp of the Cape Crusader, the ultimate gadget they had was the astonishing Batmobile. It had a bulletproof windshield, radar scope, trouble beam, anti-theft device, parachutes for brakes, and tires that reinflated if they were punctured by bullets. And shooting the bullets were the most hilariously stylized villains in television history. There was the Catwoman, originally played by Julie Newmar. For two seasons of the series, she appeared as a sexy femme fatale who always had a sassy, snappy response to anything Batman would say. Although they were on opposite sides of the law, it was apparent that she had a very strong romantic interest in the Cape Crusader, which she totally ignored. When Newmar left the series to do a feature film, she was replaced by singer Eartha Kitt, 
who continued the tradition of adding an underlying purr to every sentence. And then there was the Joker. This character was inspired by actor Conrad Veidt's portrayal of the tragic Gwynplaine in the silent movie, The Man Who Laughs. To Batman, the Joker became the clown prince of crime. In the TV series, the Joker was brought to life by Cesar Romero, who would portray dozens of Latin lovers and sophisticated, romantic leading men in countless movies. Romero's Joker possessed a wild, maniacal laugh and always appeared in a thick, grease paint clown makeup. Veteran actor Burgess Meredith, star of such films as Of Mice and Men and The Story of G.I. Joe, appeared as The Penguin. Bedecked in a tuxedo, the penguin, with his pencil-thin putty nose, always sported an umbrella which concealed a variety of lethal weapons. Meredith affected a penguin-like waddle and punctuated his speech with sardonic bird-like squawks. The Riddler featured Frank Gorshin, who had created a sensation as a nightclub impressionist, as the villain who would taunt Batman and Robin by leaving clues, always in the form of a riddle, to crimes he was about to commit. The Riddler costume was highlighted by a large question mark in keeping with his keep them guessing persona. Like the Catwoman, the Riddler part also saw a change of actors when John Astin stepped into the role in the series' final year. David Wayne portrayed the Mad Hatter, a character from the Batman comic books of the early 1960s, whose secret weapon, the Super Instant Mesmerizer, is concealed in his high hat enabling him to kidnap victims with the greatest of ease. Bookworm was a villain with a decided literary bent. His evil schemes borrowed directly from the plots of great criminal novels, stories, and plays. He was played by Roddy McDowell. Anne Baxter as magician Zelda the Great and Victor Buono as King Tut helped round out the pantheon of villains who appeared numerous times on the program. The rogues gallery also included George Sanders, Otto Preminger, and later, Eli Wallach, all as Mr. Freeze, Art Carney as the Archer, Van Johnson as the Minstrel, Shelley Winters as Ma Parker, Liberace as Fingers, Carolyn Jones as Marcia, Queen of Diamonds, Cliff Robertson as Shame, Dina Merrill as Calamity Jam, Roger C. Carmel as Colonel Gum, Shock Bergerac as Freddy the Fence, Ethel Merman as Lola Lasagna, Leslie Gore as Pussycat, Barbara Rush as Nora Clavicle, Ida Lupino as Dr. Cassandra Spellcraft, Zsa, Zsa Gabor as Minerva, and Malachi Throne as Falseface. The villainous roles of Batman became highly sought after parts in Hollywood. One reason so many major stars clamored to get onto the show was at the insistence of their Bat-fan children and grandchildren. Although many of the performers had enjoyed remarkable cinematic success, to their kids they weren't real stars until they did a guest shot on Batman. Dozens of celebrities appeared in brief cameo parts during the course of the series. Familiar faces included Jerry Lewis, Dick Clark, Sammy Davis Jr., Werner Klemperer as Hogan's heroes Colonel Klink, Ted Cassidy as Lurch, Art Linkletter, Edward G. Robinson, George Raft, and even Santa Claus, who first met Batman in the comic book days. The show's success took the TV Batman to big theater screens at the end of the program's first season. Batman, a full-length feature, was released in the summer of 1966, with actress Lee Merriweather taking over for Julie Newmar as Catwoman in this outing. Everyone, flee for your lives! Emergency. Batman speaking. Warning all of you to brace yourselves for big news. The biggest. Tell them, Robin. Holy superlatives, Batman. It's really exciting. Soon, very soon, Batman and I will be batapulting right out of your TV sets and onto your theater screens. That's right, Robin. Our first full-length motion picture feature in color opens a whole new world of thrills. <laughs> more space on land, sea, and in the air to challenge the most bataclysmic collection of super criminals ever. Their minimum objective must be 
the entire world. And here are the dastardly villains. The Catwoman. Oh, you're going to see the perfect crime when I get Batman in my claws. Oven. <laughs> the Riddler. Question. Who's going to make the feathers fly and knock Batman and Robin out of the sky? See, the new weapons in the Bat Arsenal combat the forces of evil. The Batcopter. The exploding, man-eating shark. Holy sardine! The relentless Megaton Magnet. The unholy quartet secret submarine. Fire one! Fire one! The Batboat, in action. mad, manned missiles. And you'll be with me, Robin, at the Bat Scanner, eavesdropping on Batman's romance. And you'll shudder at the death-dealing Polaris missiles. Brace yourself, Robin. This could be the end. The movie was originally scheduled to be made as a pilot for the TV series. But after the program's sudden debut as a mid-season smash hit, the film version stood on its own as a box office sensation. The movie served to fan the flames of Batman's popularity and ushered in the era's most explosive new catchword, Batmania. gum cards and clothes were staples in every household. And his comic books, which had started it all nearly 30 years earlier, were being embraced by an entirely new generation of converts. As Batman and Robin began their second season as TV superstars, they hosted a special preview of ABC's 1967 programs, which showcased the tongue-in-cheek humor that had become their signature. Did you get that, Robin? I'm busy solving a crime. Batcave, Robin speaking. It's Commissioner Gordon. I better take it. Hello, Commissioner. What's the trouble? I see. That sounds serious. We'll be right over. What's wrong, Batman? Someone has stolen a show from this fall's new season of ABC programs. Holy grand larceny! Who would do such a thing? No doubt some poor wretch who's more to be pitied than feared. Commissioner Gordon has a preview of ABC's new shows in his office right now. There's no time to lose. Let's race to the Batmobile. <laughs> I saw the room was empty. What's this? 
It's a bat mic review cartridge I invented for the commissioner last week. It should have all the ABC fall shows on it. Let's check it against the schedule. I'll just slip this cartridge into this special set and see if it's been tampered with. Ordinarily, Robin, your Aunt Harriet and I don't permit you to watch television until after you've done your homework and caught your criminals. But I'm afraid we'll have to make an exception this time. Well, Robin, Monday and Tuesday seem to be in order. Holy rainbow. Every single program in color. That's really something. And look, our own daring adventures are on twice a week, just like last season. Careful. Remember, Robin, a boy wonder should be modest. Batman's success led to the TV revival of another comic book hero, the Green Hornet, who was not only given his own show, but also made a guest appearance with a sidekick Kato, karate champ Bruce Lee, on Batman's second season. The Green Hornet, that legendary nemesis of crime with his loyal companion Kato, thrilled most of us as kids in one of radio's longest runs. Let's push this aside, Kato, and go through. I'm with you, boss. Well, Robin, according to this schedule, everything seems to be in perfect shape. I fear we've been the victims of a harmless hoax. But wait, Batman! On Friday night, they're supposed to be... Let's head back home and broil some steaks on the barbecue. But Batman! Listen to the kid. He's on to something. There's someone under that desk. I can't tell for sure, but I think it's a poor wretch. He looks familiar. Are you Milton Burrow? If I'm not, I had a lot of fun using his credit cards. Come on, Burrow. Did you say I was wanted for murder? That's right. What do you mean? ABC wants you to murder the people every Friday night, starting this September at the stroke of nine. Holy affiliates. What's my sentence? Five years. Five years? Holy residuals. Five years, that'll be beautiful. Below the line will be 80,000. Give 15 to send to my agent. New villains in Batman's sophomore year included Egghead, played by Vincent Price, and The Puzzler, impersonated by Maurice Evans. Tallulah Bankhead gave the final performance of her career as the Black Widow. The master of time crime, the Clock King, was played by Walter Slezak, and the Sandman, criminal scientist of sleep was performed by Michael Rennie. For the show's third and final season in 1968, Batman added Commissioner Gordon's daughter Barbara, whose crime-fighting persona was Batgirl, to the mix. Fear not, America. They are still on duty. That legendary duo still humbly withholding their true identity under the guises of a noble flying rodent and a commonplace Backyard bird. To the Batmobile. But what's this? That's no tricycle, citizen. Holy femininity. Batgirl. Batgirl? 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 Ah, uh, Zap and Zonk. Biff and Splash. What reassurance for those sounds. Well, the dynamic duo now becomes the tremendous trio. Batgirl was played by former ballerina Yvonne Craig, a veteran actress of such films as Gidget and The Gene Krupa Story, and TV shows Dobie Gillis, My Favorite Martian, and The Man from Uncle. Batgirl naturally kept her identity secret from her father, Commissioner Gordon. About man on television, Batman. See him in color every Wednesday and Thursday nights. Commissioner Gordon was played expertly for three seasons by Neil Hamilton, whose acting career ran the gamut from D.W. Griffith masterpieces of the silent era 
to Jerry Lewis comedies in the early 1960s. Batgirl's ally, and the only person who knew her real identity, was Batman and Robin's butler, Alfred, who had quite a few secrets to keep since he also possessed knowledge of Batman and Robin's true identities. The Alfred character was a staple in Batman's comic adventures, even being featured in his own stories in the comic magazines during the 1940s. Alan Napier, who portrayed Alfred, got his training with the Oxford Players in England before appearing in such films as Macbeth and The Song of Bernadette. The ever-so-British thespian nearly became television's first Sherlock Holmes. He starred in a nearly forgotten pilot film in 1948. Spam! Spickle Spam! Swamp Adder. Roylet must have died within 10 seconds of being bitten. He's dead. The best solution, Miss Stoner. Otherwise, he would have killed you. With Alfred lending a capable behind-the-scenes hand, Batman, Robin, and Batgirl confronted a new parade of adversaries in the final season of the program. There was the Siren, played by Joan Collins, who could sing in seven octaves and put anyone under hypnosis. Louis the Lilac was a fragrance expert, performed by Milton Berle. And Lord Marmaduke Fogg, played by Rudy Valley, took Batman, Batgirl, and Robin to the British Isles for a classic confrontation. At the end of the third season, Batman was cancelled and the dynamic duo were once again consigned to the pages of comic books. But life after Batman for Adam West and Burt Ward included a continuing identification with their famous TV roles. Conventions, trade shows, and exhibitions catered to Batman fans throughout the 1970s. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the greatest crime fighter of all time, Adam West, Bruce Wayne, millionaire philanthropist, Batman! Woo! Let's hear it! This guy, the greatest TV superhero of all time. Thank you very much, Chief O'Hara. Have you seen any unusual looking people around here? Oh, me? Do you recognize me? You, do you really? Dr. Spock? Arnold Schwarzenegger. I'll, I'll just stand here for a few moments to let you admire my incredible crime-fighting physique. Yes, watch this, kids. How's that? Huh? Oh, nothing, nothing, a piece of cake. Anyway, it's great to be here in Kansas City. It's great to be anywhere. I've been a bat for about uh, 25 years now. It gets very lonely in the bat cave. So it's always great to get out and have a chance to meet you crime fighters of all ages in person. I really enjoy this. By the way, Robin could not be here today. Bird Ward, Dick Grayson. He told me to say howdy for him. Uh, he, he really hated to miss it, but actually it's my fault. I gave him some extra homework. He's been chasing girls. It's just a terrible thing. So I figured he'd better stay in the bat cave, do his homework. He can use the bat computers to help him. Maybe he'll get a better grade. I don't know. Anyway, I know you've been waiting quite a while here in line. I do appreciate uh, your showing up. This is, I knew you'd be here, though. And I better not stand up here and talk too long because I don't want you to have to wait too long. And I know what the kids do when you wait with the kids and on your necks and sometimes the accidents. Uh, anyway, uh, you like my ears? Yeah. Oh, good. You're all right. So what I'm going to do today is uh, shake hands, say hello. We'll have a little visit. I'll sign the pictures. There are pictures available. If you'd like to have a picture of me, with me, with your name on it, they're only $82 today, which is really a great deal, <laughs> courtesy of the management. Anyway, uh, do, oh, one little warning before we start. Uh, do not stand too close to my utility belt. It's full of dangerous, highly explosive crime-fighting equipment. I have my bat gas here. shark repellent, a peanut butter and jelly sandwich over here. <clears throat> I wear my cape proudly. My cape, yes. This costume, as you probably know, many of you, was developed after many years of 
experimentation, research, development to see what might strike fear into the hearts of criminals everywhere. I tried other costumes. Dressed like a beaver. It didn't work. Like a raccoon. Finally, I hit upon the costume of a giant bat. It does strike fear. It was apparent immediately. Let's see who looks crooked. Ah, obviously a criminal. Watch, watch the reaction. See, see right away. <laughs> Anyhow, it's a lot of fun being Batman. You people have been so nice, so wonderful to us over the years. It just, it's just, it's a warm thing, you know, and, and people want to be accepted. They want to be loved when they go on a stage, I guess, or in front of a camera. So you, you've made all that possible for the old Bat. This is great. Batman entered the 1980s with a revisionist comic book presentation by Frank Miller which brought him an entirely new audience of sophisticated adults. Published by DC Comics in 1986, The Dark Knight Returns replaced the traditional Batman persona with an epic 200-page psychological adventure. It told the story from the point of view of a depressed 55-year-old Bruce Wayne and delved into his tormented, vengeful spirit. The new graphic novel sparked a renewed appreciation of the Batman TV show, and led to numerous reunions with the original cast. One of the earliest cast get-togethers was held at the fashionable Stock Market Nightclub in Los Angeles. TV and news reporters practically outnumbered the fans at the event. The crowd on hand was treated to the sight of the show's original stars, looking as if they had just stepped off a soundstage in 1968, nearly 20 years earlier. Adam West declined an offer to don the familiar bat cowl. It is an amateur, definitely, but it really is. It's very good, except he's got, well, he's had a lobotomy. <laughs> you can tell. Oh, come on, you got to try it on, please. The stock market gathering sparked an incredible amount of media attention. With newspaper coverage, radio talk show interviews, and TV news cameras recording footage of the reunion for the late news, it appeared that Batmania was about to make an inevitable comeback. Even the TV program's Batmobile continued to roll up mileage as it made its way to numerous auto shows, shopping malls, comic book conventions, anywhere the auto toured, crowds gathered. The original vehicle used on the Batman TV series had been consigned to the studio's back lot where its condition had deteriorated. Refurbished at a cost of more than $150,000, the classic was then heavily insured and traveled between appearances with an ever-present contingent of armed security guards. Batman collectibles proved to be a wise investment. Authentic props from the TV series command as much as $10,000, and an authentic costume even more. Early editions of Detective Comics, which once sold for a nickel, now sell for hundreds and even thousands of dollars at memorabilia auctions. Inspired by the success of the Stock Market Nightclub reunion, another gathering of former Batman stars was organized for nationwide exposure by producers of the Will Schreiner Show. As seen in these video home movies taken by a Bat team member, an enthusiastic crowd was on hand as Adam West and the Batmobile were reunited. The highly rated show gave cast members the opportunity to reminisce, answer trivia questions, and share many interesting anecdotes relating to their lives on Batman. Not to be outdone, another program, The Late Show, staged what was to be the ultimate cast reunion. An elaborate bat cave was created for the special, with the original Batmobile itself serving as the centerpiece for the stage. In addition to Adam West, Burt Ward, and Yvonne Craig, both of the series' cat women, Julie Newmar and Eartha Kitt, were on hand, as was Frank Gorshin, who bedeviled Batman and Robin as the Riddler. Good night, Ellen. He has his own butler. Sadly, 
the program marked the final public appearance of Alan Napier, who passed away just days after these video home movies were taken. With interest in Batman running hotter than ever, the next chapter of the Batman saga was about to unfold. By the late 1980s, the caped crusader was ready to celebrate the 50th anniversary of his creation and make motion picture history in the process. Exploding across America on June 23, 1989, the Batman movie became an instant sensation, shattering box office records in every state of the Union and ushering a new generation of fans into Bruce Wayne's mysterious and legendary saga. The movie's approach borrowed heavily from the dark persona and completely avoided the fun-loving humor of the television series. And Michael Keaton's controversial casting in the Batman role was another innovation, presenting Bruce Wayne as a readily identifiable everyman. Vicki Vale was played by the sleek Kim Basinger, a veteran of such films as Nine and a Half Weeks and Fool for Love. Familiar characters such as Commissioner Gordon, played by veteran character actor Pat Hingle, and Alfred the Butler, enacted by Britain's Michael Goff, helped round out the contemporary cast. But it was Jack Nicholson as the Joker who took the Batman phenomenon to new levels of hysterical absurdity. While Cesar Romero's TV incarnation was an acknowledged masterpiece of over-the-top acting, Nicholson's Joker brought a malevolent exuberance to the screen and effortlessly transported the garish villain to a threshold of popularity rivaling Batman himself. The Batman movie set box office records, earning its first $100 million more quickly than any other film in history, and its merchandising eclipsed all marketing forecasts, chalking up billions of dollars among its 130 toy, clothes, and bubblegum card licensees. Nearly 40 different varieties of Batman t-shirts appeared on the market, and nearly as many variations of jackets and caps accompanying them. One LA store sold 7,000 packets of gum cards in six days, a music video starring Prince was run almost hourly on music cable television, and the movie's soundtrack music album quickly sold out upon its release. The excitement generated by the new feature-length Batman spurred yet another revival of the 1966 TV Batman. Once again, Adam West and Burt Ward mounted the Bat Cycle to re-promote the original TV program. As seen in this behind-the-scenes footage, the pair were as comfortable as ever in promoting their famous alter egos. And I'm Burt Ward, otherwise known as the Crusader. And the Boy Wonder. Batman is bigger than ever, and now it's the perfect bat time for audiences to get another look at all 120 half hours of one of the best produced and most successful shows in the history of television. Julie Newmar was also enlisted to assist in the studio's campaign to promote the series. Here she displays some of her famous feline allure, proving it to be as potent as ever. Yvonne Craig joined the trio later in the afternoon to do her turn before the cameras. Perhaps the most interesting sidelight of the shooting was the fact that the interior footage was shot on the same sound stages where the series was filmed two decades earlier. A new set was constructed incorporating many authentic 1960s props. At the end of the series' third season, the original sets were dismantled and destroyed. Just as the final walls fell, a call went out to reassemble the cast and crew for work on an additional season of shows, which were to be broadcast on another network. But the sets had already been destroyed, and plans to bring the series back crumbled just as quickly. Fans can only speculate as to what new villains the potential fourth season would have prompted. At the present time, there is a great deal of speculation as to the direction an inevitable sequel to the 1989 Batman will take. Hollywood gossip hints that Robin Williams may be the next Riddler. Danny DeVito is being considered as the Penguin. And talk of Cher as the Catwoman has set the Hollywood rumor mills churning. One thing is certain, the roles of Batman villains will become the most sought after parts in movie history. While the adventures of Superman, Star Wars Luke Skywalker, 
and even the Ghostbusters involve superhuman dynamics in their quest for truth, justice, and the American way, Batman's power rests entirely within himself. His bat image is undertaken as a means of self-preservation while fighting crime. If Batman should fail, Bruce Wayne, under the mask, can still be a success. But the image also conjures an inner strength and belief in self, enabling Batman to triumph in instances where Bruce Wayne, without the mask, would otherwise fail. This all adds up to a vividly complex and continually fascinating character, whose singular acts of heroism reflect our own moral choices more directly than any other comic book, television, or movie character ever created. For 50 years, he has been our hero and his legacy will no doubt continue for generations to come. I don't know who he is behind that mask of his, but I do know when we need him. And we need him now. Yes, Commissioner. Can you come to headquarters right away? <laughs>